1 John chapter 5. I'll read verses 1 through 5. And uh, we'll get into our study. 1 John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Of God. Now, last time we were together, obviously, we closed in chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. And in those verses, John was giving us at least three reasons, when you combine it with verse 1, at least three reasons for loving people. In verse 20, he had said, love for God isn't possible if you don't love people. How can you love that which is invisible, in other words, if you don't love that which is visible? It's easier to love someone you've seen than to love someone that you haven't seen. And so he's saying, how can you say you love God who you haven't seen, you know, face to face, and, and yet you hate, you hate your brother or your sister whom you do see? And so one, he was saying, there are reasons to love God and to love people, and it's a mark of a believer uh, to love those whom God loves. You can't love the invisible if you don't love the visible. And in verse 21, he said that God had commanded us to love him as well as loving other people. God has commanded us to love him as well as other people. Verse 21, chapter 4, this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. It's a commandment. Now, I want to remind you of something. On one occasion, it's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, a, a lawyer, uh, an expert in Jewish ritual or religious law, a lawyer had approached Jesus Christ with a question. It's found in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. The question was this, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You shall love the Lord thy God with everything within you. But because God is invisible, one of the ways that you demonstrate that you love him is when you love your neighbor as yourself. So love is very practical. There are those who philosophically like to say how they love God. They're lovers of God, but they can't stand people. Well, loving God is the origin of love for others. And as a matter of fact, John would say, identifies us as his children. Remember in John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus said it like this. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, love, I want to develop this because as we've been going through 1 John, I've read so many times that he's spoken about love, right? And, and I made an assumption. We all know what love is, and I, I think to some degree, of course, that's true. We do. But I still remember we had a young teenager who was babysitting our children, and I was giving her a ride home after she had, uh, had been uh, taking care of the kids. And as we were driving home, I might have mentioned this recently. I've been thinking about it often, especially in light of the fact that John keeps commanding us to love one another. And I asked her a question, and we lived about 20, 25 minutes away from where she lived. And, and I gave her all the time she needed. I said, can you do me a favor? And she said, yes. And we we're driving. And I said, can you tell me what love is? Can you? She says, well, yeah, of course I can. I said, please do. For about 20, 25 minutes, she said, well, it's kind of like, it, it is, it's sort of, she had no clue. She had no clue. So I was thinking about that the other day, and I thought, you know, I, I use Christianese a lot here. 
I use words that I'm assuming we all know. We all know the content of. We know what it means and all of that. So I thought I'm going to share a little bit about that for a moment as an introduction. Because love is more than emotion and love is more than a sentiment. Love is something that actually demands an action. In, in Romans 13, verse 10, Paul said, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, he said, love is the fulfillment of the law. In Galatians 5, 13 through 16, brethren, you've been called the liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Love one another, love God, love others. On this hang all of the law and the prophets. Love for God is demonstrated by a concern for other people. It, it, it's something that requires uh, sacrifice, and it's something that requires a heart of a servant. Those are the two things that are attributed to Jesus Christ when it's spoken of him as being our example. So love one another, he said, even as I have loved you. Love one another in a sacrificial way. He washed their feet. He said, if I then being your Lord and master have washed your feet, you ought to be washing the feet of one another. I have done this, he said, as an example to you. And so in the New Testament, there are two basic scriptures that refer to Jesus as an example. One is of servanthood and one is of sacrifice. So Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. God is love. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He's love incarnated. And those who follow him are to love one another. And so that's what he's commanded of us, and that's what we do. And so as we're looking at this, he's speaking concerning these things. Now, in verse 1, notice what it says. It says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. Now, love for God and love for our brother or our sister in the Lord is inseparable. It is found in the very nature of a family relationship, you see. Believers love one another. Why? Well, obviously we've been commanded to, but we love one another because we're the family of God. Earlier he had said that believers aren't like Cain, a man who murdered his own brother. And so one of the ways that we can know that we're saved is the love we have for our faith family. You see, faith and love working together produces what you call spiritual assurance, he had said in chapter 3, verse 14 of 1 John, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. So one of the ways I can have an assurance of my salvation is if I care about you, if I care about church, other believers. It's easy to love those who are like me. It's easy to love those who get along with me. It's easy to love those who agree with me. But it's not so easy to love those who may not care for me or agree with me. Those people have a tendency of pushing off of bridges. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Loving each other, the mark of a Christian, and again, the mark of the movement that I got saved in, but it's been the mark of the movement since Jesus Christ initiated Christianity. It isn't something that just came to be in in, in the Jesus movement, it, it is something that has always been, that if you love God, you're going to love others. And so faith and love work together. And as I said, that, that creates what you call a spiritual assurance to us, a confidence. Now, how did we become family? Verse 1, by, by, he says, by believing that Jesus is the Christ. Now, in chapter 4, verse 3, he had written, Every spirit that doesn't confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which he says you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Now, remember, as we've been going through 1 John, some of you have been with us through this, uh, through this book, you remember in our introduction, I was pointing to a, a philosophic group that had, become, had begun to infiltrate the church of the time of John, and they were referred to as the Gnostics. 
I mentioned to you that the word Gnostic is actually a derivative of a Greek word gnosis, and gnosis is a word that speaks of knowledge. So they referred to themselves as Gnostics, or those with knowledge. And the Gnostics had begun to infiltrate the church. I mentioned to you that the Gospel of John really was written as an apology, apologetic against the Gnostic influence, as well as his epistles, especially 1 John. And so the Gnostics were contending that, that Jesus Christ could not be God in the flesh. They didn't believe that he was God's son. And they're not alone in that, by the way. Even to this day, those who belong to the Jewish faith don't believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. We know that. But neither do Muslims. Muslims don't believe that Jesus Christ is the uh, son of God. In their, in their religious book, the Quran, it says in a section called uh, Surah, Surah, it's Surah 2391, it, it reads from the Quran, No son did Allah beget, nor is there any God along with him. In Surah 112.3, he begetteth not, nor is he begotten. So that's a direct challenge to the Christian faith. So it didn't just occur 2,000 years ago with the Gnostics. It's continued to this day. So Christians are begotten. We're brought into the family of God. And the way that happens is we have a shared faith in Jesus Christ. When you trusted in Christ as your Savior, you were born into his family. There are quite a number of people who mistakenly believe themselves to be Christians because they've gone through religious rituals. You know that and I know that. Many of you in this room would say, yeah, I understand that. I believed that I was a Christian through Christian ritual. When, when you would ask me, what are you? I would have said, and I did say, I'm a Christian. I didn't use the word Christian. I used my religious denomination. For me, it was Catholic. So I'd say, well, I'm a Catholic. Are you a Christian? No, I'm a Catholic. That's just how I would respond because that's how I was trained. You know, I was trained to do that. I was trained if you go to a non-Catholic church, the priest taught us this. If you go to a non-Catholic church, don't believe a word they say when you're in that church. I was taught that. I wonder if some of you might have been taught a similar thing. I was taught that. I, that's a, a literal teaching I received. Yes, you can go to other churches, but don't believe anything they say. So from the very beginning in my religious life, I, uh, I thought myself to be a Christian, but it was only because of religious rituals. And many of us understand that. Many of us went around that. And went around believing that same thing. Well, the fact is the Bible doesn't teach that we're saved through the ritual. Trusting in Jesus Christ is what saves us. We know that. I'm giving you basic things. You know that. And by trusting Jesus, we're brought into his family. In John 3, verse 3, Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. I can still remember people when I was in the military, I would share my faith as, as new as I was in it. I was taught to share it, and I sh shared what I knew. And I can still remember people saying this, and, and, and it went past my time in the service. It continued on after I'd gotten out. But I would say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, and I had this happen more than once where they would say, well, you're a born-againer. And I said, do you know how one becomes a Christian? Well, no, not really, I said. Do you know that, the, that we didn't invent the term born again? Because a lot of times people say that you, you invented that. No, no, this came out of Jesus unless you're born again. That came from Christ. I didn't make that up. He said, unless you're born again, you will not see, neither will you enter into the kingdom of God. And so we entered into the body of Christ, not because my mom baptized me at this little Catholic church by Alvarez Street, as every Mexican kid in California was. When I was four months old, I still have my baptismal certificate. No, I, I, I wasn't saved because of that. I was saved because I received Christ as Lord and Savior. I was born again. And, and because we sincerely believe in him, uh, the Bible speaks of us as being regenerated. And not only are we regenerated, given new life, but we are also transformed. And so loving one another in Christ is an evidence of salvation. Now, he says in verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God. How can I know? Well, we love God and keep his commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. 
And so how can I be sure that I, that I love people? Well, my love for God and obedience to his commands reveals that. Again, through service and sacrifice. You see, the, the fruit of loving God and keeping his commands is going to be love for those whom he loves. And so he says in verse 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. So a life of obedience to the things of God demonstrates that you love him. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? How can you say that I'm your Lord? Because at that time, the word Lord meant that there was a, a rulership over me. The one who was my Lord, the one that was lording over me, or the one who was Lord over me was to be obeyed. You didn't have attitudes with those who Lord, were the Lord over you in that, in that society. So how can you say you love me, Jesus said, if you don't keep my commandments? How can you say you have relationship with me when it doesn't matter to you what I say? How can you say that? You know, if I was dating a young lady and, and I said these things are important to me and she didn't care, if I said these things matter to me, but she didn't even bother to figure out why or ask questions or even on occasion to do that, which she knew would make me happy, I would have to begin to wonder, does she really love me? Because she doesn't do the things that I ask of her. It's very simple. It's very basic. But we can tell the Lord, oh, I love you so much. I'd go anywhere. I'd do anything. But the fact is, sometimes we just don't do anything he wants us to do when he says that. So one of the ways for us to know uh, that we're in love with him is when we love others. So he said the command to love one another is not a burden. It's a joy. It isn't a burden. It's not a burden for me to love my wife. It's not a burden for me to love my children. It's not a burden for me to love my grandchildren. It's not a burden for me to love my friends. That's not a burden. It's not hard. It's not difficult. You see, obedience to that command creates a community and a community that God is pleased with. Now, again, I mentioned this a moment ago. We often speak of love, but sometimes we need to define it. What is love? I mentioned that a moment ago. Some people really can't give you a definition. Now, I'm not going to give you a thorough study. I'm just going to touch on a few things. And if you take notes, it's found in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 8, the first portion. He begins to describe, Paul does, what love is. This is what he says. I'm just going to read through this. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to verse 8, he said, love is long-suffering. In other words, love resists becoming impatient, even when it's wronged. Love is kind. That word thought, uh, kind means thoughtful or considerate. It speaks of doing things in the kindest of ways. That's what, by the way, for me, I, when I first got saved, I was speaking to somebody. I was just saved. I was speaking to somebody, and I said, this is something I'm asking God to make me. And this is when I was 20 years old. He's been working on me for 52 years in this one thing, because I asked him for this. I said, Lord, I want to be known as one who is kind. Kind. I, I, I'm very, very attracted to those who are kind. It's a thoughtful person, a considerate person, someone who does something in a very kind way. He says, love doesn't envy. We've, we've been looking at that. Envy is the sin that, uh, that God Jesus uh, crucified. Uh, envy is harboring evil towards others because of their success. Love doesn't parade itself. Love doesn't seek to win the applause of others. That's one of those things in ministry that you ought to, as, as, as uh, believers in Christ, you ought, to, you ought to, and I don't mean this in the, the most, um, in the way that it could appear, but I, th I think you ought to use that as a measuring rod for people like me who are pastors. You know, um, do I seek the applause of man? If I do, that's wrong. If I'm asking for people to pay attention to me or regard me or, or applaud for me, or there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. And I have to say this quickly, but it's true. In our churches today, sometimes the pastor becomes the hero. That's not a good thing. There's only one hero. That's Jesus Christ. And the pastor should be submitted to him equally. So love doesn't parade itself. It doesn't seek the applause of man. Someone once said they seek the applause of heaven. 
He says, uh, love, love isn't puffed up. <laughs> puffed up. It, it speaks of having an inflated estimation of your own importance. Don't you know who I am? That kind of thing. Love doesn't have that attitude, an inflated estimation. Love isn't rude. We, we know what rudeness is. Love doesn't treat people wrongly. Love doesn't seek its own, meaning seeking, what it means is we seek to, 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 to care for others because we, we refuse to seek to have things done our own way. Love isn't provoked. It isn't easily irritated, angrily flaring up when pushed. Today I was pulling into a parking space to get a cup of coffee this morning. Yep, and somebody opened up their door as I pulled in. Their windows were tinted so darkly I couldn't see somebody in the car. And I wasn't speeding in. I always go in slowly. But as I was pulling in, she opened her door and creased, you know, hit, my, hit the, f- the right front end of my, of my car. And I was talking to Marie, and I was saying, you know, I was just, I, I told her a little while ago, I said, you know, I said, I was having such a good day. You know, I was feeling like, hey, you know, Lord, kind of like Snoopy with my nose in the air swinging in my hands, you know. But you know what? Um, those things happen, right? Those things happen. And, and so, you know, I flattened her tires. But <laughs> love isn't provoked. It isn't easily irritated. Love thinks no evil. It's interesting when you read the words thinks no what that means is it doesn't catalog sin. It doesn't keep a scorecard. It's not somebody who writes things down. This guy was telling me how his wife, whenever they have an argument, she gets historical. And I said, you mean hysterical? And he said, no, historical. She reminds me of everything I've ever done wrong, you know. So love doesn't keep a scorecard. Um, love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. Love doesn't take pleasure when someone fails. Love rejoices in truth, meaning love is blessed by other people's virtues. Love bears all things. That means that you endure insults and trials, difficulties, and you don't complain. Love believes all things because we trust God's promises, and we hope the best in people. Love hopes all things. Even after others have stopped hoping, we rest in hope. Love endures all things. We remain steadfast even in the midst of suffering. Love, he said, never fails because love endures forever. It never ends. So the command to love isn't a burden. The word burden, when he speaks about it being burdensome, it it, it simply means something that's heavy in weight. It speaks of something severe or stern, something cruel, something unsparing. God's commands are not burdensome because love for God lightens his commands. Now, why are they not burdensome? Well, one, because they've been given to us as a benefit, to benefit our lives. In Deuteronomy 5.29, oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me, to keep all my commands always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. God's commands were intended to bless, to restrict evil behavior, but to put us in the position where he could pour out his blessings. Oh, that they would be inclined to fear me, he said. In Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord in his statutes, which I command you this day for your good. Why are his commands not burdensome, guys? Because they're for our good. Every parent in here knows that the majority of the orders you've given to your children have not been to restrict them from enjoying life, but is to protect them from harm that can come by making bad decisions. It's not because you're mad at them that you give them orders. It's because you love them. Because you know that if you put them in a position of doing that which is right, their life will be going well, they'll be blessed. And sometimes they don't do what is right, and then you have to spank them. Like when my son David was very young and 
probably six or seven. He knew he knew what was right and what was wrong, and he had done something wrong. And I said to him, "Son, you know, right now I I really ought to uh, to spank you." I said because um, what you did really deserves me chastising you, but I'm going to teach you a lesson, son. <laughs> He's around seven. I'm going to teach you a lesson, son. I'm going to teach you what grace is. Grace is me giving to you something you don't deserve. Right now, you deserve being chastised. You deserve a spanking. But I'm going to resist spanking you so that you can see what grace is. Oh, thank you, Dad. Thank you, oh, great one. I said, yeah, <laughs> no problem. Then he did it again a couple days later. And I went in and I said, you know, I told you not to do that. You know what he started doing? He started yelling, grace, grace, dad, grace. I said, no, la, wham, you know. <laughs> you gave them orders, commands, so that their life would be blessed and so they're not burdensome. God gives us commands because he wants to bless us. Secondly, it, it gives us directions on how to please him. He tells us what he requires of us. In Psalm 119, 104, 105, I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light for my path. They give us direction. Third, he supplies us with the power to perform what he commands. God never gives to you a command that he doesn't also supply the power to obey. He gives you a command and the power. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You shall receive power. So he has given us the power to obey those things he commands. In Galatians, in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, Paul said it like this. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Are you going to fulfill the things God called you to do by the energies of your fleshly nature, or are you going to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? Uh, I was, Pastor Chuck was my pastor for, for many years, Chuck Smith from Calvary Coast to Mesa. I was part of a, a board with him and remain on a similar board to this day. And we would meet with Pastor Chuck for planning retreats and things. And, and every time we would meet, there would be a number of us from all over the United States. I can still remember we'd be seated at a table, several tables actually linked together. And we'd be talking amongst ourselves. Many of us knew each other for a long time. We'd be visiting, catching up when Chuck would walk in. And when Pastor Chuck walked in, a lot of people, I think, misunderstand our relationship with him. Some think that, that we worshiped him, and there's nothing further than the truth. We loved him. We knew he was a man. He made his mistakes and all of that. We expected that he would. But he also was a man of God that we respected very much, and he was our pastor, and he was my pastor for a long time. But when he would walk in, it was, also, it was really funny because none of us were young men. You know, we're all older and all. He'd walk in, and we'd get real quiet, like Daddy just walked in the room. It was really kind of interesting and funny. And he would come in, and he would sit down. He always sat in the same place. He gets quiet, and the very first thing that he would be asked every meeting when we gathered like this was this, Pastor Chuck, what are you concerned with? What are you concerned with? What is on your heart? What are you concerned with, Pastor? Have we begun in the Spirit and shall we be completed by the flesh? He said that every time he was asked, what is your great concern? That the churches, the Calvary ministries, will begin to try and attract people through fleshly means and no longer rely on the power of the Spirit and the power of the Word of God. And that's a lesson I learned from my own pastor, but that's something we find in Scripture. Have we begun in the Spirit only to be made complete by the flesh? No. If we began in the Spirit... We continue in that way, and he supplies the power for us to do so. Now, notice verse 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Overcome speaks of conquering. It speaks of carrying off the victory. A commentator said this speaks of Christians who hold fast to their faith 
even unto death against the power of their enemies, temptations, and persecutions. So here's something that we need to be aware of. We today, I believe, really need to take this to heart. We need to realize that though we are people of peace, we are in a spiritual war. We just went through Ephesians chapter 6 recently. We have spiritual war. Christians are actually, and this may be something people don't, maybe don't feel good about what me saying, but it's true. I think most of you will, though. We're warriors. That's what we are. We're, we're called by God to be warriors. We don't get participation trophies, you know. Everybody's a winner. We, we, no, no, you're in, you're in battle, aren't you? You're in spiritual warfare every day. You can't even get a cup of coffee. <laughs> you, but you are. You have to put the helmet on. You have to have the shield. You have to have the sword. You have to be ready and prepared. And I think the church is asleep at the wheel. We really need to understand what's going on is demonic. It is spiritually demonic. It's not just a political thing. It's a demonic thing. When you take a little boy and tell him he can be a little girl if he just wants to be, you've got something demonic going on. And here we are listening to psychobabble when the fact is God created male and female. It's so basic. And yet we're in an argument today. And it's true. So we're in a war. And the war is not necessarily, though it is, but not necessarily for my old soul. You're old. I'm going after your grandchildren. I'm going after the babies. I'm going after the kids. I'm going to have a drag queen reading stories at a public library, and you can do nothing about it. You can't do anything about it because it's the right thing for them to do. They need to be without discrimination. The word discrimination means the ability to discern or make a judgment. No, they have to have discernment. They have to have discrimination. They have to be aware what is right, what is wrong, what is black, what is white, what is sweet, what is sour. They need to know those things. Where are they going to learn that? They learn it at home. They learn it through their parents. They learn it in their churches if they go. They should be. You need and I need to know, and, and I'm, I'm aware of this, and I hope we all are. I hope I'm speaking to myself right now. You're in a war. You know it, and I know it. And there is a constant war. You see, Satan doesn't go on vacation. He is after you 24-7, he wants to destroy you. The one he doesn't go after is the backslider because the backslider does him a lot of good because people say, if that's a Christian, then I don't need it. No, he's after the warriors. That's who he goes after, the hardest target. That's what he does. We learned that in the military, go after the hard target, go after the hard one. And that's what the enemy does. He goes after us. So we're in a battle, not only on behalf of ourselves, but also for others. And the Christian life is a life that encounters adversity as well as resistance. So because of that, we remain firm in our faith in God and his word. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 23, the writer said this. He said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. When he says, let us hold fast, that word hold fast, that, that those words, speaks of being unyielding, without wa wavering, firmly. Someone pointed out that these words could be used in a nautical sense. It meant to hold fast, fight through the storm. Holding fast to our faith means that you stand upon your faith and you're unwavering. It means that we're not intimidated, that we're not convinced, that we're not brainwashed by outside forces. I, I hope we're all this way because, you know, I, I, I spent a long time in secular college. And uh, more than one of my professors was intent on brainwashing us with their political or their psychological or their philosophic beliefs. They wanted to convert us to their way of thinking. It's worse now than it was when I was in school. Much worse because it starts earlier. It starts in preschool now. It goes all the way up. And so we need to stand firm. We need to know what we believe. And we need to not be intimidated. 
I remember on one occasion I was asked to speak at a uh, high school graduation. When I arrived, the person in charge, um, it was a baccalaureate, the, the person in charge said to me, now you have to realize that, you know, this is a public school. You can't speak about Jesus. And I said, really? Yeah, you have to keep your words neutral. I said, really? And she said, yes. So I went up. And I said, you know, I want to congratulate you seniors. You know, this is a celebration of your graduation. You've spent many years in going through school from kindergarten here to the senior year. And you've jumped through all the hoops. You've completed the courses. You've, you're, you're on the brink of graduating. You've gained a lot of knowledge. But the most important knowledge is this, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the knowledge that he died on a cross for you. He died for you to give your life purpose. I was never invited back again. But you're not intimidated. You don't hide your, your light under a basket. You, you, don't, you don't look for a fight. We're not to be belligerent and pugnacious. We're not to be picking fights with people. That's, a very, that's not a good thing either. You just need to be prepared with an answer to give it at any moment that God gives you opportunity. That's what you do. And you don't hold back. I, I, I did that quite often. I did it in, in different college classes. You know, I would speak about Jesus Christ. I had people mock me. Yeah, of course. Of course they're going to. But you know what? If somebody's listening, if somebody's going to hear, that matters. And, and, and I, I found that a long time ago that, that sometimes people are just seated there waiting for somebody to say what they'd like to be said. I remember two ladies in one class, and they, they pretty much took over the class, and I was kind of tired of it. And finally, you know, they did it every week. And then finally, I finally asked the professor a question. I still remember saying to him something about, it was a marriage and family class, and I said to him, uh, is, it, is it true that, that it is more, um, it's more beneficial to a young child if there's a father and mother in the home? Doesn't that help him? In the future, this is a basic question. I wanted him to speak about that. One of the ladies turned and said to me, well, she said to the professor, and then she turned and looked at me, but she said, can I answer that question? And I said, listen, if I was wanting your opinion, I'd have asked you. I, I want to hear his, not yours. She didn't like that, and the other one jumped in. There were two of them, tag team. And so I, I, I talked to her too. And afterwards... People walked up to me saying, thank you. Thank you. Because you know what? There are many people who want to hear truth. And here we are being told, be quiet. You can't say that. No. No, I don't believe. And I'm not teaching you to go out and pick fights. I'm not. What I'm saying is just be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks. And when God gives you opportunity, take the opportunity. Sometimes it's just a short burst. Sometimes they may ask questions. But be ready. We, we, aren't, we aren't concerned. We hold fast, and we're not going to be brainwashed by the world. He's already spoken concerning the world's influence in chapter 2. It said, love not the world, neither the things in the world. But we need to understand we have an adversary. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So what do we, what do, we do? Well, James 1.21 says, Lay aside all filthiness, overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. There is no promise or guarantee for us to live a trouble-free, affliction-free life. We know that. On the contrary, the battle's real, and injuries are suffered but we remain firm. In Revelation 2, verse 10, Jesus, speaking to the church of Smyrna, said this. He said, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. For 10 days you will have tribulation, but be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus simply said, the gates of hell will not prevail. You see, ultimately, we desire to say what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. 
I have kept the faith. And that's only possible through Christ and his power, the power he makes available to you. We stand firm and hold fast to what God has said. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, Paul said, Thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And though we have internal and external pressures, we are still overcomers. What is it that gives us the the ability to overcome? Verse 4, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Victory comes through faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. We're not saved by naive or blind optimism. Our faith rests on the victory that's been gained by Jesus' work. Remember, one of his final words on the cross was, it is finished. Verse 5, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The overcomer knows that Jesus supplies power to overcome. And so Romans 8, 31 and 32, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? In Jesus, we partake in his victory over the world. And one last thing you need to remember The one who overcame the world dwells in us. Never forget that. Verse 4, chapter 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He dwells in us, and in him we overcome. Never forget that. Our Father, we just give you blessings.